you all for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Kate. I am a member of the events team. So, welcome to the Strand Bookstore. I am pleased to introduce the former poet laureate and Pulitzer Prize winning poet Charles Simic. He is the author of, I believe if this is correct, uh, 34 volumes of poetry as well as 14 collections of <laughs> translations. He's also written eight books of prose that include Dime Store Alchemy, The Art of Joseph Cornell, and more recently, The Renegade. Tonight, he'll be in conversation with Taya Obrecht, whose first novel, A Tiger's Wife, The Tiger's Wife, garnered much acclaim and attention, winning her the coveted Orange Prize. And she was the youngest novelist to date to win the award. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, The New York Times, and The Guardian. So first tonight, what's going to happen is Charles is going to read some of his poetry, um, and then we're going to have a conversation with Charles and Taya, question and answer, interview, all of that. Um, and then we're just going to have a really brief Q&A with the audience, and then we will have them sign their books. So please welcome Charles and Nick. Good evening, good evening. Uh, let's see. It's always an event to be in Strand Bookstore. I have purchased books over the years here, uh, some very nice, rare books, and I also sold more books than I purchased over the years. <laughs> and I was walking up uh, Broadway, I, I remember selling a, a book. Uh, this was. Um, I would say roughly 1960, 1961. I lived on uh, uh, East Street, just off University Place, and uh, I worked at New York University in the payroll department. I used to get paid on Friday, and uh, usually I would be broke by Monday. But uh, you know, I don't even remember how. It was Saturday morning, and I was totally, completely broke. Uh, you know, with the rent to pay and whatever else I could do paid, and uh, I had sold all my you know, books worth selling, but I had a book that I, a guy who used to live in that apartment where I lived, in a little place, gave me, which was a, the Oxford Latin Dictionary. Uh, it was a book about this big, and uh, I, I just felt that this is a book that I have to have, although I never consulted the book. But just to have this you know, incredibly impressive book of probably 4,000, 5,000 pages. So in my desperation, I said, well, I, I got to sell this book. I mean, and uh, it was Saturday morning, uh, and the uh, street's empty. I mean, in this part of New York in those days, I mean, you know, I mean, all of New York, you know, Saturday mornings, was, the streets were great. Empty, but this place was open. I don't know, it was like nine o'clock or eight o'clock. So I carried this book, which I mean, tend to be you know, really heavy to carry. I mean, a huge thing, the kind of thing that you need a lectern like this to, in, in libraries to, to sit down. And I came in and uh, brought the book to the, uh, it was in front, it wasn't in the back where you sold books. And it was this South Plus who, uh, you know, I never broke a smile, always gave you, you know, the price of the books. And I expected I had, you know, in those days, like 10 bucks was a lot of money because a hamburger special with french fries and everything else would be like 69 cents. You know, I could eat a lot, you know, get a Coke, do whatever. And uh, whatever, Frank, I really had some visions of, you know, I, I thought 10 bucks for sure, maybe, maybe even 15. And he offered me $5. I was stunned, and uh, then I, it was between carrying the damn thing back about five, six blocks, or selling it, I sold it, of course, and, uh, uh, but that was just one of the many times, uh, memorable moments um, at Strand Bookstore. Mm -hmm. So let's see, I'll read some poems, and, uh, uh, Actually, I read mostly from Master of Disguises in 60 poems. But here are a couple of poems from, well, just, let's see, what is this book over here? Uh, I don't even know what this book is. Oh, this is an 
argumentations. But anyway, let me read the poem. It's called, uh, the poem is called To Fate. You were always more real to me than God, setting up the props for a tragedy, hammering the nails in with only a few close friends invited to watch. Just to be neighborly, you made a pretty girl lame, ran over a child with a motorcycle. I can think of a million similar examples, ditto, how the two of us keep meeting. A fortune-telling gumball machine in Chinatown may have, may have the answer. An old creaky door opening in a horror film. A pack of cards left on a beach. I can feel you snuggle close to me at night with your hot breath, your cold hands, and me already like an old piano dangling out of a window at the end of a rope. This is a, a book of you know translations into Italian, but they they also have the uh, the poems in English. And uh, the nice thing about something like this, uh, this comes all from the noise of my noiseless entourage, a book called My Noiseless Entourage, uh, is that you kind of you know see the poems in a different type in different contexts. You you see you discover them, you discover them in a strange way, because you have the book, you see them for years, the same book, and. Uh, you know, as I turn the pages, I just don't see any more the poems on the page in a way that I would see it in something totally different. Uh, so here's a poem called, My Turn to Confess. And I remember how this sort of occurred to me, somebody asked me, we were talking about interviews, in an interview, what do you think about confessional poetry? Uh, <laughs> And I said something like, well, you know, if the poet is a good liar, you know, and then, you know, I think that's fine, you know. As long as he or she doesn't tell the truth, you know. Uh, but anyway, so I, then afterwards I felt guilty, you know, by this guy, so I said, uh, let me write my own poem. This is called My Turn to Confess. A dog trying to write a poem on why he barks. Mm -hmm. That's me, dear reader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were about to kick me out of the library, but I warned them. My master is invisible and all powerful. Still, they kept dragging me out by the tail. In the park, the birds spoke freely of their own vexations. On a bench, I saw an old woman cutting her white curly hair with imaginary scissors while staring into a small pocket mirror. I didn't say anything then, but that night I slumped on the floor, chewing on a pencil, sighing from time to time, growling too at something out there I could not bring myself to name. All right. Uh, from the most recent book. Uh, and this is a kind of a, a little unusual poem. Um, it occurred to me, I mean, this poem was written maybe two, three years ago. Probably three years ago. But before that, it occurred to me one day I was reading something, I don't know what the hell I was reading, something about history where 1938 was mentioned, and uh, I, uh, I thought, like, my God, this is the year I was born. I thought, like, well, a lot of things were going on in 1938. I mean, amazing, you know, I was a little kid in a crib and, uh, you know, trying to pull, pull off my booties or whatever, you know. I mean, all these things were happening in, in the world. And uh, so then it occurred to me, I want to find out, you know, what was going on simultaneously with my, with my early days. And uh, you know, a few years before, I would have gone to the, to the library and gotten some almanacs and you know looked up things and so forth. But uh, what I did now, I, looked, I googled it. I didn't tell you. And in you know, in less than a minute, you can find 
pretty much everything that happened uh, in 1938. I was interested, you know, more or less historical events, you know, popular culture and so forth. But I got an immense amount of information and um, I made it, well, it wasn't really quite a mistake, but I printed it and it turned out to be like, you know, 80 pages of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so I had all this stuff. And then, you know, how to pick and choose because there was so much interesting stuff going on at the same time. It took a long time. I think probably the poem was finally finished about three years ago, but it took maybe a couple of years, if not more. I kept putting things in, putting things out. I knew it couldn't be a very long poem because you don't want to go on and on and on, you know. Uh, but, um, you know, there were so many tempting options. Uh, so it, it's the only poem I've written like that. I mean. Anyway, here's the poem, 1938. That was the year the Nazis marched into Vienna. Superman made his debut in action comics. Stalin was killing off his fellow revolutionaries. The first Dairy Queen opened in Kankakee, Illinois, as I lay in my crib, peeing in my diapers. You must have been a beautiful baby, <laughs> Bing Crosby sang. A pilot the newspapers called Ron Way Corrigan took off from New York, heading from California, and landed instead in Ireland, as I watched my mother take a breast out of her blue robe and come closer. There was a hurricane that September causing a movie theater at West Hampton Beach to be lifted out to sea. People worried the world was about to end. A fish believed to have been extinct for 70 million years came up in a fishing net off the coast of South Africa. I lay in my crib as the days got shorter and colder, and the first heavy snow fell in the night, making everything very quiet in my room. I thought I heard myself cry for a long, long time. in the city. Uh, so I lived in you know, furnished rooms and flea bag hotels in the village. And uh, um, I didn't want to go back to Chicago because my friends told me before I left, what are you doing in New York? No, you don't know anybody there. And I, I don't know, dismissed it. I, I always wanted to go back to New York. I first lived in New York after I came from Europe. And uh, you know, I was a snob. I just wanted to go. Not enough jazz, not enough. Theater, not enough gallery, not enough, not enough, you know, it's just, you know, a little, a little snob, you know, I came to New York, I didn't know anything. So I, I'm, I really lived in some places that were truly dumps. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hotels where you know, knew <clears throat> that the room that you occupied, there were murders committed there, you know, there was violence, <laughs> major violence. I mean, uh, you know, a carpet that hadn't been changed in, you know, 30 years. And you can remember in those days when people really chain smoked, you know. <laughs> and so anyway, this is one of these dumps. Self-portrait in bed. For imaginary visitors, I had a chair made of cane I found in the trash. There was a hole where its seat was, and its legs were wobbly, but it still gave a dignified appearance. I myself never sat in it, though with the help of a pillow one could do that, carefully, with his knees drawn together, the way she did once, leaning back to laugh at her discomfort. The lamp on the night table did what it could to bestow an air of mystery to the room. 
There was a mirror, too, that made everything waver as in a fishbowl, if I happened to look that way. Red-nosed, about to sneeze, with a thick wool cap pulled over my ears, reading some Russian in bed, worrying about my soul, I'm sure. <laughs> It's wonderful to write about one's youth, you know, from a distance, you know, being in your 70s, and uh, you realize you were an asshole. It's <laughs> 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 just, and, uh, you look at it as great affection, you know. It's, uh, how did this guy survive? You know? <laughs> Across the street. <laughs> And my mother was right, you know, she said, you know, I had to cross the street and go to New York. Anyway, let's see. Uh, something entirely different, I would imagine. What are we doing here? Ah, oh, okay, this is sort of a poem about books and uh, it's a poem called In the Library. Uh, I have several poems about the libraries. I spent a lot of time in libraries. And uh, I mean, the great thing about a you know, bookstore like this, a great bookstore like this, and uh, you know, great libraries that you read, you walk around, you know, and suddenly you see something like, <gasps> you know, uh, I mean, you just can't believe this book exists. And, you know, after decades and decades of being a you know, bookworm, you, you sort of think like, at least I've heard of something like that, but something totally incredible. And, uh, you know, you, you just start to leap and grab it, you know, you think somebody's going to beat you to it, and whatever. Yeah. And they're very exciting moments. Uh, and this is in the library, and this is a book that has a terrific title. The book is mediocre, I mean, in the title. And the poem is dedicated to late uh, Mexican poet Octavio Paz, because one day we were talking about books that had fantastic titles that turned out to be shit. You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, uh, this is not quite like that, but I, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend it. You know? <laughs> Don't break a leg, you know. In the library for Octavio. There's a book called A Dictionary of Angels. No one had opened it in 50 years. I know because when I did, the covers creaked, the pages crumbled. There I discovered the angels were once as plentiful as species of flies. The sky at dusk used to be thick with them. You had to wave both arms just to keep them away. <laughs> now the sun is shining through the tall windows. The library is a quiet place. Angels and gods huddled in dark, unopened books. The great secret lies on some shelf. Miss Jones passes every day on her rounds. She's very tall, so she keeps her head tipped as if listening. The books are whispering. I hear nothing, but she does. Title, I think I could sort of give, kind of roughly guess what I had in mind, but I don't really remember. Uh, I mean, the nice thing about a lot of poems, you have no memory of how they were written. But, mm -hmm. uh, as in my case, I mean, I think it was them, I revised them endlessly, you know, but sometimes it takes, you know, months, sometimes even years. So, but anyway. Uh, Title, I think very often you say to yourself, oh, this sounds good for a title, you know, so, yeah. I'll work around it. 
This is called, The Soul Has Many Brides. In India, I was greatly taken up with a fly in a temple which gave me the distinct feeling it was possible, just possible, that we had met before. Was it in Mexico City, climbing the blood-spotted yellow legs of the crucified Christ, or his eyes grew larger and larger? May God seat you on the highest throne of his invisible kingdom, a blind beggar said to me in English. He knew what I saw. At the saloon where Pancho Villa fired his revolvers at the ceiling, and the bare ass of a naked nymph stepping out of a lake in a painting, and now shamelessly crawling up one of Buddha's nostrils, whose smile got even more secretive, even more squint eyed. Let's see. Short. <laughs> yeah, this is a poem that, and to my embarrassment now, needs uh, an explanation that, uh, and I don't even know what it was written, uh, but it describes the time, I guess it was in the maybe late 70s, 80s, when we changed from plots that you had to, and watches that you had to wind up to the time when you know batteries. But I mean, if I you know if you tell young people this, I mean they look at you like they have more understanding what they're talking about. <laughs> I mean the fact that there was a time when every timepiece ticked. I mean you visited your grandparents, you know, who had inherited clocks and you know four generation and uh, you know we went nuts <laughs> because if you had to spend the night because they were all a little bit off and this and that, you know. And you got 30 clocks and, you know, going like, like you know, horror movie, like a horror movie. They used to do that here in, you know, bad movies if somebody was coming to a, right. a horrible decision, you know, to, to strangle their wife or, <laughs> or whatever. It was something going insane. So, but then, you know, there was a, this was a time where, you know, all of a sudden, like, you realize, uh, you know, time was sneaking by quietly. I mean, it wasn't anymore before you, you know, you could tell. You know, I wake up at night, you wake up in the morning, and, you know, you go nuts, you know, with your alarm clocks and so forth. The clocks of the dead. One night, I went to keep the clock company. It had a loud tick after midnight as if it were uncommonly afraid. It's like whistling past their graveyard, I explained. In any case, I told him I understood. Once there were clocks like that in every kitchen in America. Now the factory's windows are all broken. The old men on night shifts are in Karen's boat. The day you stop, I said to the clock, the little wheels they keep in reserve will have rolled away into many hard to find places. Just thinking about it, I forgot to wind the clock. We woke up in the dark. How quiet the city is, I said. Like the clocks of the dead, my wife replied. Grandmother, on the wall, I heard the snows of your childhood begin to fall. This is a New York City poem, summer heat poem. Last week, when it was really hot and humid, that this would be the kind of weather. Although this, I think, occurs in July or August, and uh, oh, I think nineteen fifty. Nine, maybe something like that, and uh, uh, so uh, well, I think it's all here. It's called Paradise. In a neighborhood once called Hell's Kitchen, 
What a better claim to be playing Nero's fiddle while the city burned in midsummer heat. What a lady barber who called herself Cleopatra wielded the scissors of fate over my head, threatening to cut off my ears and nose. What a man and a woman went walking naked in one of the dark side streets at dawn. I must be dreaming, I told myself. It was like meeting a couple of sphinxes. I expected them to have wings, bodies of lions. Him with his wildly tattooed chest, her with her huge dangling breasts. It happened so quickly and so long ago. You know that time just before the day breaks, when one yearns to lie down on cool sheets in a room with shades thrown. The hour when the beautiful suicides lying side by side in the morgue get up and walk out into the first light. The curtains of cheap hotels flying out of windows like seagulls. But everything else quiet. Steam rising out of the subway ratings, bodies glistening with sweat, madness, you might even say paradise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. at the bottom. Hello. Hello. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Um, so this is a this is a very great honor for me um, to be able to talk to you about your work. Um, I was reading uh, a great deal. I've, I've I've been a fan of Mr. Simic's poetry um, and was reading up on his biography in order to prepare for this interview. And I thought, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find something really cool to ask him that's never been asked before. But the truth is that you've had such a, a long and incredible career. As I went through the interviews, I was like, I'm not gonna ask him anything he hasn't been asked before. Um, so instead, I am merely going to ask the things that I want to know, <laughs> and uh, hopefully some of them will match up with the things that you want to know. And then afterwards, uh, you get to ask them too, I think. Um, so thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, I'm a fellow Yugoslav, um, and uh, uh, more importantly, I feel uh, a fellow Belgrader. So I wanted to open by asking what your memories of your childhood in Belgrade are. Well, I mean, I had, you know, like any war child, I, you know, I had plenty you know, of memories. Uh, uh, as I, I you know, mentioned this many, many times, I, mean, I was born in 1938, as you know now. And uh, on April 6, 1941, Belgrade was uh, bombed by the Nazis. Uh, Germany attacked uh, what was then Yugoslavia. And uh, uh, we lived right in the heart of the city, in the center of the city. I think it was 5 o'clock in the morning, something like that. And a bomb hit the building across the street. Pretty much destroyed it. I, mean, I don't know if it's one bomb or more. but. Right. And uh, I was in bed, I was, you know, two years old, and uh, I flew out of bed. I was landed on the floor, and what I very vaguely remember is sort of bright lights, and the building was on fire, and, and broken glass, and my mother, who was in the next room, you know, picking me off of the floor, and uh, carried me away, and uh, went down the stairs, you know, to the cellar, as we you know, used to do, whatever. But, uh, you know, I grew up in, a, in an occupied country that uh, was occupied by, mostly by you know, Germans, although there were some other parts where we were occupied by, you know, Italians, uh, occupied by Hungarians, you know, I don't know. You know. Uh, there was also a civil war going on in, in Yugoslavia. Again, depending how you count, you know, three, four, five, maybe six factions, you know. Uh, killing each other pretty much in the countryside. Actually, being in the city was much safer uh, than being, you know, in some small village someplace. Um, and 
I mean, I mean, you know how it is. I mean, if you, if you live it right in the, in the heart of the city, and the, the you know, streets were, used to be full of kids in those days, and kids played in the street even in those years, and you know, you could, you could stop you from going down and you know, playing with his kids. And uh, I mean, my memories really become consecutive and, and vivid. Uh, are, well, 1944, when uh, 1944 were bombed by the Allies. Uh, we were not going to hit us because we were kind of pro-Allies, but they were going to hit the Germans. Uh, but they never hit the Germans, they hit us, you know. And, you know, people sort of accepted that. That's what I think. <laughs> but the general got luck, you know, <laughs> with everything else. So, uh, so there was plenty of action. So my memories of the war are extremely vivid. I mean, the end of the war. I mean, you know, I, I've written about this stuff, and uh, uh, because of just you know, I mean, you know, just all the stuff is going on. I mean, you you know, when you know, when there, you know, dead bodies on the street, people hanging from you know, dolphin poles, you know. Uh, you walk out, or you know, many yeah. other so things have been going on, and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, uh, those are my memories. And then after the war, of course, you know, I believe from 1953, I mean, it was, I mean, it was commun communism and so forth. You know, the kind of you know, arresting oppression, you know, the usual stuff. But it's a big, the big thing that uh, after the war, I mean, we were starving after the war. I mean, there was like nothing to eat, uh, and uh, so that's what I remember. Plus four years. On the other hand, uh, I really don't have any. I mean, some I don't have bad memories. I mean, I saw some awful stuff, but I, I really had a great time with it because, uh, and I used to think that this is something about me that I'm a little defective in some way. Uh, you know, all those bricks fell on my head because I really had a ball. You know, because I was always playing on the street. You know, parents are all busy. You know, God knows what. My father was in Italy uh, toward the end of the war, and then come back, and uh, my mother. And, you know, it's just you know, they you were know, running loose like all the other kids. Paradise, you know, in New York. So years later, you know, I met people like who grew up in Warsaw, Berlin, at the same time. A wonderful one of my age. I grew up in, in Warsaw, in Warsaw, 1944. <laughs> it was not exactly a place to be. It was off, you know. And uh, she says, there's a child, she says, you're forgetting one thing, the reason we were so happy, because there was no school. You <laughs> 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 kid me. You me. She was absolutely right. I've forgotten that thing. I remember, not so much me, but the little older boy saying, you know, all these bombs falling, how come they never get out of school? <laughs> so, that, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, I'm, del I'm delighted to hear from others the same thing. <laughs> so. If, since there was no school, what was your relationship to literature growing up at that time? Well, I mean, what you did is, you know, you read, you read anything, you would get your hands on once I, you know, you could read and, you know. Winter came and uh, yeah, crummy weather, and uh, I mean, it started off. You read comic books. I mean, before the war, before comics came in, in Yugoslavia, all the American comic books were you know, translated and so forth. And so there was all that literature and just you know all kinds of trashy literature. And then after that, I just out of sheer you know boredom. I mean, my father had a big library. And, Read grown up books and uh, uh, enjoyed some of them. Uh, I mean, it's cool, you know, we read Yugoslav uh, literature, you know, we had to read poetry, but uh, I don't remember the school at all. I mean, being interested in it, and, I mean, I read poetry. I mean, the way, the way, you know, like everywhere else in the world, the way, I mean, the way the literature was, you know, was especially poetry taught in school was, it was a form of punishment. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was everywhere like that. I mean, later on, before the, 
I mean, not before I came to the United States. I was in Paris in school for a year, and uh, uh, it was the same thing as poetry. We read, you know, great 19th century French poets, you know, all the you know, great masters, Baudelaire, Rimbaud, Redline, you know. But we had to memorize the poems. And, uh, you know, when you, the teacher who just, you know, they were lazy old civil servants, and they had, you know, class take turns, you know, reciting these poems. And for me, you know, it was terrible because I, I spoke French with a heavy accent, and uh, I mean, made it. My fellow students really enjoyed it. I mean, it was so funny that I was pronouncing the important lines, and uh, La Martin, and so forth. But for me, it was like, you know, horror. So really, literature made an impression to me. It was like really private reading for me that I read, you know, in really idle hours. And, I mean, I read things that I shouldn't. I mean, it's ridiculous to me that, you know, at a very early age, like, you know, Dick Kings or of Balzac, I mean, things that are really grown up books and God knows what else, you know. Maybe I could get my hands on it. It was not, there was no other way to spend, you know, a wintry day or a rainy open day. Sure, except, except with the kind of books that are like, I understand the words, but I, I don't know what they're saying. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, well, I think it probably made an impression. So um, you've been a city dweller for much of your life. First Belgrade, and then Paris, and then Chicago, and then New York. And I think it's no surprise that um, cityscapes figure really prominently in your work. Uh, what is it about cities that moves you? Is well, being a, you know, being a city person, I mean, my I, I, I imagination gets activated in a way it doesn't in the country. I mean, I've been living in New Hampshire since 1973 in a little village, and I you know, feel at home there. I love it, and, uh, and this and that. But uh, I don't notice, I was going to say as much, no, I don't notice, you know, 10% of what I notice in the, in the city. I never see anything. People have to, you know, give me a shot. So look at that bird, that bird. <laughs> 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 but in, in a city, you know, it's like the, the moment I'm on the street and I look down the block, I see people coming this way, that way, I look at faces. By the way, you know, scenes of associations, uh, you know, you, you think, you know, to your past. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, 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 I, my imagination is stimulated, entertained, as it is at the moment in the city. I feel at home in this place. I mean, I've traveled. I've been in other cities in the world, and I, I just really feel, you know, instantly at home in cities. I mean, I don't have to talk to city people to go to a or, you know, someplace, you know, one of the best taxi drivers, you know, I don't know. But uh, I love living in a country, but I, I just, you know, it's not the same thing for me. Would you say that there's something, you know, universal about cities that transcends geographical location? Oh, I, I think it is. I mean, I think that, you know, when I came to Paris, uh, what I liked about Belgrade, I mean, we live fairly close to the, it's not the same thing, you know, okay, yeah. and so far. Right? In those days, we lined up with movie houses, and uh, we were about four blocks from there, and I'd sneak over there to check what's in the movie that you know. uh, a lot of theaters, maybe a couple of movie theaters just showing westerns, you know, you know, sit there for, you know, skip school and stand there like for an hour looking at the, you know, the photographs of, you know, Randolph Scott. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's his pistol and that. So, that's what I loved about Belgrade. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't appreciate the old kind of Turkish Waters, the old small homes, houses, very right? pretty. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that's meant absolutely nothing to me. What I what I like is the modern part of the city, you know, where they, they feel felt like you're in the 20th century. I mean, the thing about Eastern Europe, I mean, this is true of you know, not just Belgrade, but I think people told me it's like you know, it's from Sofia or you know, Bucharest. When you leave these cities, even today. I mean, but especially in those days, when you get by the time you get to the outskirts, you're in 19th century. Uh, if you are 
go another 30 miles from in the 18th century. If you keep going, you'll end up here in the 10th century. Uh, so, <laughs> so when I got to Paris, again, what I really liked, I liked this sort of modern Paris. I, mean, I was, did not admire, you know, Place de Vosges or I don't know what, but something pretty beautiful. Old. Uh, quarters and places. No, I like, you know, Champs Elysees, again, movies, you know, the Grand Little Arbors. Again, movies and uh, nightclubs and so forth. And this is, oh my God, this is like Belgium, just you know, <laughs> 10 times bigger and, you know, 50 times bigger. So, and then, of course, when I came to New York, I said, oh, well, you know, can't beat this. This is, this is really great. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's interesting. I, I feel like growing up in, 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 in places that had, you know, a, a really rich heritage, I never appreciated it until after I left. And then I'd be like, yeah, it was beautiful, wasn't it? And then people will ask him, like, it was beautiful, but you really never paid attention to the uh, old part at all. Um, I'm finding myself very lucky uh, right now to be writing on a daily basis. Um, I try, or at least pretend to try, because there are people sitting here who need to hear that, um, <laughs> to treat writing as a job. Um, I make an effort to commit a certain number of hours to the desk every day, uh, and while I wrote The Tiger's Wife, most of those hours were between uh, midnight and 5 a.m. Uh, you're a self-professed insomniac, um, and much of your poetry deals with nighttime loneliness and spectatorship of strange moments and surreal entities as a result of nighttime solitude. Uh, would you consider insomnia a part of your writing routine? I feel like it's somehow well, ties I mean, it was. Life. I mean, I, it, you know, there was also a practical aspect of it. When I lived in New York, I had to work during the day. I mean, I had office jobs, you know, nine to five jobs. So, I mean, after work, I mean, I, I mentioned I worked here at one of my years, a number of years, and the, I mean, then I would go to bars after, you know, when you five o'clock, you know, go over and have a beer. And uh, they make a you know, tour of the bars. And, you know, if I came home by midnight, it was an early night. It's just I had infinite energy for those days. I mean, really, I mean, now I realize this. Uh, I always, you know, set up a little bit and, and wrote. Um, and uh, I did that for quite a long time. Uh, even when I got to New Hampshire, I would I liked, you know, quite hours. And, uh, and then, you know, eventually, uh, I still in, in insomnia, I mean, but I know just sort of lying in the dark. I, I think what really changed is uh, I used to smoke in those days. And, uh, you know, sitting and playing at night. And smoke, you know, listen to other kinds of whatever. But now I don't. I mean, so because my eyes are not as great, you know, and they run around. And, uh, so I don't do it. I mean, I know most of my writing now is done either fairly early in the morning or around dinner hour. Dinner hour, I'm always getting inspired, you know, like an hour before dinner, especially if you know, I can smell something interesting happening in the kitchen. Instantly, my juices, my pudding juices, uh, begin start to flow. So uh, I think the, I mean, that's how you think about the difference between you know, what you do. I mean, you fiction writers really have to work. <laughs> I mean, it's really, yes. I mean, in poets, nobody can write poetry for eight hours. <laughs> I, mean, I, I write a lot of prose, as you know, and I write a strong pieces for the academy of books and this and that. And you really have to work. I mean, I, 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 I could spend you know, six, seven hours working on, on, on some you know, essay you know, day after day. You can't do that in poetry. I mean, very, very rarely because it happened to me that I really was on a kind of binge. I mean, that I you know, worked every day and, you know, for, for hours. You know. Most of the time, you, I mean, these things come to you, like I think about the poem, like my confession. You know, that was probably, you know, jot it down and then I went to the restaurant, you know, waiting for dinner, you know, 
comes up and draws some more and comes up here and there and there. In poetry, I mean, the, you know, later on, the thinker was a device of endlessly. I mean, this is something that you, you know, you say, I gotta, gotta finish this poem. I have to do it you know, today. You know, I want to have a ten line poem. <laughs> no. I mean, uh, you know, I tell you know, people, you know, students, I mean, you know, it's tell them like, nobody can write a five line poem or a four line poem. You can't say to yourself, I think I'll write a five line poem. Because the poem is a five line poem. You can see a five line poem you know, from across the room. Somebody can pull a book over there, and I can see. You know, as they open the page, you see that's a five-line poem. And without being able to see any words, I have certain expectations. <laughs> the first line's got to be a pretty good line. Who's going to throw you in? You know, what the hell are you going to, you know? Well, I'm for sure. You're going to wait to line three, you know, to find out what's going on. We just simply pull you in, you know? And you read out, you know. And then your expectations are when you get to line five, it's going to be something exciting, you know? Like, oh, oh, you know? Oops, you know? That's pretty good. I think I'll buy this book, you know? <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, how do you write a five-line poem? By endlessly tinkering, you know, with something that's much longer, and, you know, like sort of an accordion effect gets longer, shorter, longer, shorter, longer, shorter, longer, shorter, lines go by, and then one day you look at it, and you say to yourself, there's only five lines here that are worth keeping to make a poem. So that's a very different way of you know, working than the uh, you know, way of fiction. Worth trying, though, I think, even for fiction. Because <laughs> the problem that I often have is that if anything I write is way too long. And so it's usually only the, the five lines, even though they're not in the poetry. Well, I think it's always easier if we have more in the cut. Yeah. yeah I, I, it's, uh, I like, I like. You know, pairing them down and cutting them. Just very often it's sort of, it's sort of astonishing because when you realize that you spent months or sometimes even years deluding yourself, there was I had this sort of sequence of poems, like one poem or a sequence, something about New York City. I don't even remember what it was, but it was like four or five pages. And one day, it wasn't five lines. I mean, I reduced it to a dozen lines. It seemed fine. Uh, but that, that thing, you, know, you kind of find a poem in something that is much larger. Or in my case, I mean, the, you know, there's no, no way to generalize about all poets. I know a lot of poets, and everybody writes differently. Uh, but the way I do it, I you know, ask Um, have you ever been surprised to learn something about yourself, your preoccupations or thoughts after looking back on completed work? Well, I mean, you do. I mean, I think that's the. I mean, that's a sort of. A, I mean, the kind of the interesting thing about being a writer. Uh, and, you know, you, it comes slowly in my case because you don't, you know, you don't reread your poems, think about it. You, know, you don't look at your poems from a, from a distance or you know, critically, where you know, that I look at somebody else's poems and don't have time to do that. You don't know, want to spend time looking at this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, um, there are other things to do. So, uh, they come as a surprise. But at some point after my, I've been, I've been writing for, since 1959, it's the first time I published a uh, poem in Chicago in New York, so a long time. Well, let's say after about 40 years, maybe longer, it just hit me how much violence there is in many of my early poems. And I, uh, I'm a person who really dislikes violence. I mean, I've seen too much violence, you know. I mean, uh, 
put an associate myself <laughs> in there. But, you know, all those you know, warriors and so forth and so on, everything that I've seen is really, you know, cracked up in, in my poems. And there's so many hangings and there's so many atrocities. Uh, and uh, they really have, you know, they're really not just all sort of biographical elements, but uh, they, you know, every time that I saw something like that happening in the world, you know, it was a kind of a vision, I remember you know, what I witnessed and so forth. So, you know, that, that really, the extent of it, you know, you know it kind of surprised me. Because uh, I would have, if somebody asked me directly a question, are you obsessed with violence? I would have pretended, or not pretend, I would have I would like the self knowledge to admit this. I was out, you know, what good nature can be more like as a girl. Commissar of prison, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. I think, I think that leads um, into my next and, and final question, um, and something that, that I've been asked myself. Um, and due to your background, I'm pretty sure you frequently get asked some form of this question. Um, do you feel that committing to poetry, or indeed any art form, comes with a sense of social or political obligation? No. I mean, uh, no. Uh, I, I think... Me neither. No, it's... Uh, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, well, look at, you know, American poetry. I mean, you know, Walt Whitman was certainly aware of the Civil War. He wrote poems about the Civil War. He wrote prose and this and that. I mean, Emily Dickinson does not mention it directly. I mean, she wrote 1,700 some poems. Uh, she lived, she brought me to her house in Amherst, I mean, her room, looked at this church from across the street where weekly, Funerals of, of young boys, many of she knew, who died in the Civil War. So you would expect, you know, that she would pen something along this line. She wrote many letters of beautiful letters of condolences, but she didn't. I mean, it, it never occurred to me to say that she's a lesser poet. I mean, it is an obligation. I mean, I've written about politics because I'm always interested in politics. I'm reading newspapers and, you know, but I, I think it's, I mean, what I dislike about that sort of question is that it sort of implies that, you know, writers, you know, that they are sort of have a special vision of um, certain obligation to say something about this because they're sensitive souls, they're because of qualities that are, and the rest of the world is, you know, waiting to hear. And when I think back to the, uh, the reading, 40 readings against the war in Vietnam, I mean, I participated in them and I you know, went to them. I mean, they really, I mean, the stuff that was read, I mean, everybody who wrote in their heart was in the right place and against the war and so forth. But the point really sucked. <laughs> I mean, it was really, I mean, nothing of the stuff has remained. You know, for an excellent reason, because it was worthless. I mean, they were, they were not even as good as good editorials against the war. And uh, I mean, so that kind of cured me. And then, of course, you know, we come from all from Yugoslavia. I remember communism was in school, but about school literature. We had to read all of them, you know. In those days, it was like Stalinism, you know. I mean, poets who told us about the you know, how happy the workers are, you know, <laughs> digging ditches and, and uh, working in mines. And, uh, so, no, you know, I say I hate that stuff. You know, I've asked that question. And yet, I mean, this is another subject that is really, if you look at my poems, I mean, every book, I mean, there are at least four or five poems that have to do something with that reality which we describe as you know, politics and that so uh, But it's it's <laughs> it's liberating to hear that, that I feel you can 
do it in in you know as as a personal reaction to something as opposed to some sort of required yeah, I mean, that, response. Exactly. I, mean, yeah. I mean the idea of ordering somebody to do something. Mm -hmm. Right back to the ditches and just digging more ditches. Yeah. Um, those are uh, those are all my questions. Thank no, you so, so much, Mr. So, yeah. What do you find more challenging, the writing poetry or translations, or is it which is your favorite, or is it on an even? Key? Well, I mean, everything is hard. If you want to do anything, writing is hard. I mean, huh. uh, I mean writing an essay is hard. Uh, you know. uh, Translation has you know, sp sp special difficulties. Um, uh, I feel that, I'm just, I mean, it's a, it's a vast subject, but I'll, I'll just sort of narrow it down to this. Um, I have poems that are written a long time ago. I know that perhaps, you know, they're not all what they could have been, but it, in most cases, I'm not going to touch them again. Uh, because what the hell? I mean, it's mine, and you know, it's, you know, forget it, you know. Uh, translation is an endless labor. What really is awful about translation, not only that you work sometimes you know, for years, you know, trying to translate a book, but then let's see if the book has been around for 30 years. Yeah. Was it translated back in the sixties? And uh, I don't read those books anymore. But occasionally it happens that I somehow one of those translations comes across, and I instantly, looking at the translation, I can see how this could be <coughs> translated better. Some idiom some turn of phrase that just escaped me, although I tinker it, slave of it, whatever this is. And then you look at it and say, oh. so it seemed to be never finished. I think if I had time, you know, maybe, you know, maybe <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I, I mind waiting and be translating some of my favorite poems, like Vasco Popa, very difficult for to translate, but the living story I'm poem. And he translated some of those poems, because, you know, they're short poems, and you, you look at it and you realize that one line, you really screw it up. Very <laughs> awkward. <coughs> it's not so much that you, <coughs> that you miss the, the meaning of the damn thing, but it just, it sounds like translation. Uh, and the solution that eluded you all these years is only there. So that, that's translation. Uh, it's just, you know, and, and you're on point to you say, bye bye, I don't know if you want to look at this thing. You know. Other questions? I was wondering, um, in your writing process, which ends up taking sort of the most paramount and important set? Image, sound, history, memory? Well, I think it depends. I mean, you know, all of those. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think I've written poems from every one of those things. Sometimes you just kind of have a, as you say, a sound. You go around and kind of like. Mumbling. <laughs> 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 As if you know, somebody says, you know, what are you mumbling about? Who's mumbling, you know? <laughs> and then you realize, you know, and they're mumbling, you know? Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, the others, the best, to me, the most pleasurable poems, and not the poems where you, you have, as my granddaughter, and the granddaughter was two years, seven months old, and eight years late, she'd be saying, hey, guys, I have a great idea, you know? But those kind of poems when I think, God, I have a great idea. They turn out to be, they don't work. You, know, um, you spend months and say, like, that was not a great idea. It's <laughs> not how poems get written. Images, um, you know, something, 
you know, suddenly pops in your memory, like in a poem, Paradise. I did see that couple. This was someplace around, God, you know, Ninth Avenue, maybe 40, and 50th Street, 49th, or whatever. I had gone to a poker game. And uh, not that I was a gambler, I, it was more like a kibitzer. I mean, I, I didn't have any money or anything. But anyway, when I left, I didn't have any money, so I lived here in the village, and I was going to walk back home. It was a nice you know, morning, going and this and that. And I did meet this too. And uh, I didn't think about them for years. And then when I suddenly popped in my memory, this poem was written in, uh, let's see, that book came out in, um, Jesus, 1990 or something like that. It was probably written, written in mid-80s, uh, and what happened was, you know, to say, in 1959 or whatever. Then everything else came back. I mean, just the whole, you know, all sorts of other memories. It pulled all kinds of other memories. And, uh, even more interesting poems are the poems where it's a kind of a phrase or an image where you have no idea where it comes from. You first think it's, it has nothing to do with your past. It's not. But you love it so much that then you work, your task is to sort of invent a poem to go along with it. And uh, it's great. It's an adventure. You have no idea where you're from. And uh, it may work, it may not work, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I think, yeah, I think we'll take one more question. Okay. I, 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 actually, I'll ask for you too. I mean, I'll get to you too. <laughs> uh, I actually have a question for Ms. Oh, okay, sure. Hi. Oh, hi. Uh, <laughs> hi. Uh, I read the Tiger's Life. Thank you. Uh, I really liked it. Um, and my question is, um, you know, you have many layers in the story, like, uh, there's a main story about Natalia and her grandfather and the war, and then there's the two sub-stories of the tiger's wife and the different men, and then there are sub-stories in the sub-stories, like, uh, for example, example about um, the Risada hunter or the butcher who wants to be a musician, um, and these stories render depth to the main story, um, and what I wanted to ask actually is how does that work for you when you start a story? And because you you have one layer and then it's superficial, how do you do that with the sub, sub stories? How does that work in your brain? Like, you, you know, it was it was <laughs> it's a good question. I I don't know. Um, I it was it was my first time writing, so I think that everything every aspect of, of writing the novel was a complete learning experience. And half the time I was like, I don't know, let's try this. Um, but. Eventually, I think that, that what kept me going on, sort of deeper layers of it, was that I would feel that it was too superficial, or that I didn't understand properly the you know what a certain character was doing or where they were coming from. So I would write something so that I would understand it myself. Um, and then the effect that it had for me, um, and I know that for, for some people it worked and, and some people it didn't, was that uh, it was sort of a 3D picture that started to form and the layers sort of expanded in directions that I hadn't, that I couldn't really account for and hadn't planned on, um, on which I had not planned. Um, and so eventually I ended up having to storyboard it because I was like, I don't know what all these people are doing and what time they're doing it at. And then, you know, and so that was the, the sort of practical solution to it. But um, it, it was the first time that uh, like a project had taken off on me and, and sort of left me behind and I was like, uh, guys? Um, but, but that's how it happened. Thank you. I was just hoping that you could share with us some poets that you have admired over the years. Well, I mentioned, you know, Whitman and Dickinson. I think Dickinson is my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, Wallace Stevenson and Dickinson have two poets that I can read every day of my life. I mean, there are other, lots of other poems that I you know, adore. I mean, I, I mentioned those French poets that, um, you know, I hated at that time, you know, recite those poems uh, 
humiliate myself, but um, I realized many, many years later that saying those poems aloud in a uh, beautiful French language, uh, and, and Baudelaire, still one of my favorite poets, and also I really was a huge influence on me. But I didn't, I didn't understand that because I was completely young. Know, Wiped out the period of the suffering of standing in front of the class. But later on, I realized I kind of, when I started you know, writing, when I, you know, I, without realizing, I think I was trying to sort of imitate something that I, that I heard. So um, it's, a, it's a huge list, but I think Dickinson and Stevens. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.